Well, hello, uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on your time zone. I want to welcome everyone to the Golden Shovel webinar, Bringing Success to Small Towns. I'll be introducing our CEO, Aaron Bressois, in just a second. Uh, I want to just make one quick announcement, and that is that this is the highest, uh, highest registered webinar we've had. Now, the great thing is I've had to say that three months in a row. So our popularity and topics continue to attract, continue to bring in attention, and we're very pleased to have everyone in. So thank you very much. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items. This webinar is recorded, and we will be sending this out with a slide deck uh, and links that people can review the material afterwards if they so choose. So uh, that will be available. My name is Ron Kresha. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Golden Shovel. Really excited to bring this webinar and to have Aaron present his ideas. What I think you'll find is this is a, a comprehensive review of all of our ideas and, and really why we're in business, which is we believe that communities no longer need to compete with uh, inferior tools and that the technology has come to a point where, where communities can compete using sophistication and uh, smart economic development marketing. And we're excited for that because at the end of the day, we believe in empowering economic developers. We believe in helping people uh, build their communities. And we want to provide those tools so that they can do what they do best, which is meet with site selectors, meet with businesses, uh, work through USDA loan, all of that stuff that I know many of you have to do besides think about marketing. And so hopefully we can help give you ideas and give you tools that take some of that off your plate. So with that, uh, you really need to hear from Aaron and he's promised me he's going to be engaging and interesting today. So with that, Aaron, Aaron Bressois, I'd like to welcome you to the webinar and, and let you take it from here. All right, thank you very much, Ron. One thing I should mention, Aaron, and I apologize, I should write these down in notes. If anyone has questions, please type those in the question panel on the right hand side of your screen and I will feed those into Aaron uh, at, as the, at the appropriate time. So again, I'm all yours, Aaron. Take it away. All right. Thank you very much and uh, thanks everybody for attending today. Just looking forward to presenting. Uh, this uh, presentation uh, began at the NET conference uh, last week down in St. Petersburg, Florida for the, the Touchstone Energy's new and emerging technology conference. and for those of you that weren't able to attend, I wanted to, an opportunity to be able to share the information with you today. So thanks for joining and attending, and perhaps some of you were able to see that there. So, so what we're gonna be talking about today is bringing success to small towns, and particularly how to take advantage of uh, some of the new emerging technologies and more sophisticated tools that may seem out of reach to smaller towns, but are truly great opportunities for them. And so without further to do, let's get cooking. I promise Ron, this would be engaging. Well, the first thing I want you to consider is that in the next five years, due to Moore's law, technology is gonna advance 32 times. So that's uh, only five years out, it's gonna be 32. But the nature of this means that in the next 10 years, the technology is gonna advance a thousand times. And a fun exercise is to think back to 2008, 10 years ago, and think about where you were and what types of tools we were using, and consider that that technology from then has already advanced a thousand times since then, just 10 years ago. And I bring this to light because the speed of which things are changing right now are much, much faster than the speed at which economic development organizations are changing and the industry is changing as a whole. Um, with an exception of the, the handshaking, there isn't very much that we did before the year 2000 that's that relevant to the industry um, as far as uh, getting the word out about uh, whether it's attracting workforce or trying to attract businesses and about the community. So I want you to know how quickly this is changing and then start to put yourself in the, the mindset of that these technologies are gonna come, they're gonna be faster, they're gonna be more powerful, and that they're gonna be the opportunities that you're going to need to take advantage of in order to stay ahead of the curve, and, um, and they'll be ready. But ironically, I want to start with something very low-tech, and it goes way back to 
the very beginning of how humans communicate. And that's the idea of storytelling. And we've always been communicating through stories. In fact, I would argue that most influences happen because of great stories, stories that move people, stories that uh, get people to uh, consider new futures and new possibilities. These stories that we create are at the basis of all economic development and marketing. Um, it is the ad of the 2018s that we can send out to people as the stories of success that are going on in our communities. And there's different types of stories to talk about. We have uh, the aspirations and beliefs. There's the David versus Goliath. There's uh, the challenging assumptions. We thought it was going to be this, and then it was this. Um, and it's important to find a, a type of story that's going to resonate with your audience. And when you're going to make a story, you got to really consider first who you're writing that story for. Because the person that you're looking to, uh, to share that message with um, it has to make sure that the story relates to them and that they find it aspirational and see how it might uh, uh, affect their decision making or their future. So if you're looking to attract workforce or talent, it's a very different type of story than if you're trying to attract, say, an aerospace company from a specific target industry. And this is, uh, this is uh, from uh, storybrand.com. And uh, there's seven basic elements of a story. I want to touch on a couple of these. You have a character, and the character is the hero of the story. The hero of the story is going to be whoever you're writing it for. And they have to have a problem. And you might wonder, why would you want to have problems? Why would you be communicating problems out in your messaging uh, for promoting your community? And the main reason is because without a problem, it's not a very good story. And if you're going to make a story that's going to move people, um, having that conflict is important. And they're going to meet a guide. Most likely it's going to be your organization or an economic development. They're going to get a plan of how they can succeed from that guide. They're going to think about that plan and weigh it back and forth, and they're going to get called into action. And that's going to re result in either great success or dismal failure. And uh, that also, the success and the failure part at the end, is what makes our story exciting. You don't know if it's going to be a success or know it's going to be a failure, but certainly the success stories that uh, you'll be creating for your communities are going to reflect that. Uh, one story that was incredibly successful uh, that was done by the Pure Michigan Economic, uh, Michigan's Economic Development Corporation was a workforce attraction campaign that they pushed through LinkedIn, and they were looking to attract IT professionals from the Bay Area to consider working in the state of Michigan. And the story went like this. There was a gentleman who went, who lived in the Bay Area, was working in Silicon Valley, and he went to his buddy's wedding out in Michigan, and he was really impressed with the large lot and huge house that his buddy had out there for the same price he was paying. Then was thoroughly impressed with the great mountain biking experiences since he was an avid mountain biker, he got to bike around, and then found out there were all sorts of high-tech jobs in the area, he ends up going back, moving his family out there, getting a great job, and now is living the dream with a better quality of life and a better uh, um, uh, better future for himself. And that is the story that got more shares, more likes, and more tweets and follows than uh, any other um, story that particular year. So we're going to talk about how to capture these stories and how to make them and then get them out. Once you've got a good, solid story that you want to share, perhaps it's the success of a business that's expanded in your region or is very really thriving, or perhaps it's um, some talent that's already thriving in your community that are great role models for people considering moving there. And in this case, this is Yankton, South Dakota site. They take their success stories of these um, thriving talent, and they are able to make them into stories and photos and videos and put them on their website. Here's a bunch of different ones like Abby and here's a Ben, the Yankton entrepreneur. When you go in there, you can watch a video of Ben talking about why Yankton's such a good fit for his business and starting it. There's some nice photos to support what a great time he's having there. And if you read through the article, uh, it talks about all the reasons why he's thriving. Uh, another example, here's Rebecca and Jeremy. Uh, they're out gardening, they like mountain biking, they're cruising around in their convertible, and they're having a great life in Yankton, South Dakota. And for somebody considering um, 
moving to a region to see that there's people like them uh, that are really living their life and they look really happy is a great motivation motivational story and help with uh, influencing their own move there's also business success stories and i'm going to expand a little bit on and be talking about eastern kentucky today but they attracted a 1.3 billion dollar investment from brady industries that brought 550 advanced manufacturing jobs these types of success stories are absolute gold when it comes to marketing to related industries. One project that we did in for the Wyoming Economic Development Association was help them collect and curate success stories across the state of Wyoming. And so in this scenario, um, we were able to work with the association to make a story from each of the different counties, uh, the different communities, to make a full picture of all the different types of successes that were happening in 2017, that was compiled into a, a wonderful newsletter, of, a little larger than a newsletter, it ended up being about 20 pages of success stories that they were able to use to show uh, the impact that their association and the organizations from their state are having in the country. And it also made for content that then the local groups were able to use uh, to promote their own success stories, the ones that are for their respective regions and areas. Um, this is the type of content that then becomes uh, the, the meat and potatoes, if you will, behind the advanced marketing. We were able to put those success stories onto the WIDA's website, highlight where they were located throughout the state, and then people can click on and learn more about uh, the results. Another thing I want to touch on about storytelling it's not just a written story. Uh, storytelling is visual, it uses all of the different senses. And in the visual sense, a, a picture can literally speak a thousand words. And here's just a couple examples, like with Irvine uh, Chamber Economic Development, world-class advantages in Irvine. It tells a story right away up front with the photos. A good Life from Region 5. This is a five-county region in central Minnesota. and they're uh, looking to attract workforce to the region and showing uh, the, the great life in all seasons. This tells a great story just with the photo. There's a new economic dynasty in Utah Valley. Uh, Forbes ranked Utah number one business five out of the last six years. Tells a story of right away of what it's going to be like there. And uh, I just really appreciate this photo uh, from Greater Gallup Economic Development Corporation, energizing the workforce. It's just a beautiful a beautiful perspective on what people might imagine Gallup to be like. So this is the first part. So I'm going to be touching back on these stories along the way, but finding the story in the community, that's something every community can do. Every community has a story. Um, and once you've got those stories and we know who we want to send them to, then we can start taking advantage of a variety of different types of tools to get that story out to people. And the first one I want to talk about, I'm going to showcase a specific uh, case study of a project, but making a strong regional website presence. And I'm going to look at Great River Energy. Now, Great River Energy is a generation and transmission cooperative out of Minnesota. They have over 94% uh, coverage of the state, and they provide energy to 28 distributive cooperatives throughout the state. Um, they have a huge they have a huge impact on the economic development game in in the state of Minnesota, and they wanted a, a way to take their success stories and communicate them, um, not just through their own site, but be able to provide it as support for all of their distributive cooperatives to be able to share with uh, the communities and across the state as a uh, as they do their uh, promotion. So I was going to showcase some of the different pieces in here. First of all, there's the Great River Energy homepage. Uh, as you scroll down the, the site, you'll see right away off the back, we have their main focused uh, areas that they're looking for, the data centers and agriculture, forest projects, mining, advanced manufacturing. As you scroll down, you'll find an area where you can highlight over the different service territories. And um, those are uh, clickable. I'll show you what those go to. Now, I'm not going through the entire site, but I wanted to talk about some specific particular sections. So inside 
the Great River Energy site, we've created um, special sections for the specific industries. Now, we like to call those micro sites in that they can have their own URL. And that way, if you're out at a data center conference, for example, and that's who the people are you're talking to, and you want them to come to your website to check out all of the offerings for data centers, why send them to the main page of your site when you could send them to the data center uh, site that speaks completely to them? Uh, economic development is very competitive. You don't have very many opportunities to make a first impression. So the more you can customize that first impression to the specific audience, that you're looking to communicate with, the better uh, chance you'll have to make a great uh, impact on them. And so Great River Energy knows that they have a specialized uh, capabilities in these areas and in these industry sectors. So if you go to the data center uh, section, you'll find uh, first uh, all of the graphics and stuff relate to the data centers. Uh, there's other information in there relating to them. There's egg and forest products, if you go here. There's slightly different color variations to give it a different uh, feel, even though it's still same part of the same portal. So think of a microsite as not a site that's very small, but instead in a specific micro set of the economic development audience that you want to communicate strongly to. Now, another thing that Great River Energy did is they wanted to be able to uh, represent all of the 28 cooperatives in, a, in an equal fashion, in a way that empowers those groups. And so they made a, we made a series of profile sites so that each individual cooperative can have a page that has uh, their, the data on it, has information about um, uh, what their service territory is like, what the quality of life is like. And so here's an example of one of these. This is Connexus Energy. This is just a profile uh, page inside Great River Energy's economic development portal. You can see a description and a graphic on the top. As you scroll down the site, you're going to find uh, infographics with the various data on them. It looks like demographics, housing, income, workforce. Go further down, there's the quality of life information. You can get the recent news under there as it's relevant, so they can post it to specific, uh, if they have a good success story, so too, they can put it in a specific cooperative or they can share it across the whole network. And then to Further that control, since a lot of these uh, distributive cooperatives don't have a full, uh, full working economic development professional in there. Uh, in some cases, they have community, um, community development people, and a couple of them have economic development people where they can really engage the sites. And in those cases, we set it up so it's possible to adopt the profile site and make it their own. In this case, Dakota Electric Association, which is one of the um, distributive cooperatives can actually have their own site. It's still connected to the overall economic development portal, but they have their own navigation in there. They have their own, um, all of the information is tied to them. They have full control of the site from the back end. They can put in their own stories. And when they do, those get shared with the network as a whole. We've done the similar structure with Powder River Energy Corporation. Uh, that's a Northeast to Wyoming. Uh, the difference here is Powder River Energy was a large distributive cooperative, and so the sites that are inside those are actually cities, counties, and business parks. Another way to engage the community and uh, once again make it so that when you, the success stories are ready to go out, there's a larger network, a larger uh, way to get those stories out in front of people. Instead of just sending it out of one site, you're sending it out of multiple sites. All right, and so the next thing I'd like to speak about is the advanced marketing. Now, there are unprecedented ways to get the stories out. And one of the things we've really been focusing on is social media. Um, in honesty, other than uh, having a great website, almost all of our outreach efforts are done through social media with economic development organizations these days. And the main ones that we focus on are LinkedIn and Facebook. Now, Facebook, uh, we found some great uses for uh, informing a community internally into your community and absolutely for workforce attraction. It's got a massive percentage of online adults using it. 
Uh, this is from 2016, so this is a little old, had almost 80% of all online adults are on Facebook. That's a very powerful tool and we can't, uh, we can't take that for granted. But when it comes to target industry and business attraction efforts, LinkedIn is our go-to. And there's a few reasons for that. One of them is that the age groups are appropriate for the types of uh, business decision makers that we're looking for. Um, most of the group is going to be between 30 to 64. We are looking for people that are most likely going to have some college or college degrees, and that's the majority of LinkedIn users. We're going to be looking for people with higher salaries or salary expectations, and you're going to find the majority of LinkedIn users have 50,000 plus salaries. 45% um, have 75,000 plus. Those are oftentimes going to be business decision makers. And there's even though there's a pretty strong usage of this between urban and suburban, there's a lesser usage of it by rural groups. And that's important for today's conversation because we're talking about how smaller towns can get their stories out. And when there's lesser use by rural groups, to me, that's an opportunity. And it's an opportunity for us to uh, take advantage and to, especially as long as other groups are not on it, then makes it more powerful for um, a small town to be on it. So let me give you an example of uh, one that we, a uh, campaign that we ran. So uh, we're talking about uh, Eastern Kentucky. Uh, one of our clients over there is One East Kentucky. And they were excited to find out that they had a, brought in the Brady Industries, which I mentioned as a success story earlier and had a brand new uh, aluminum aircraft aluminum manufacturing plant coming into the area. It set a tone for the aerospace cluster that they were trying to communicate out to other aerospace decision makers and companies to consider moving to the region. So we put an article together called Seven Reasons Why Aerospace Companies Are Considering Eastern Kentucky. Uh, and so what you're looking at right here is this article posted through LinkedIn's um, so I guess they call it a, a publishing channel called Pulse. Now, once that article is posted in Pulse, it's able to be shared through uh, the One East Kentucky company page. Uh, we can share it through Charles Sexton's uh, page himself. He's the executive director there and be able to push it out. And we ran this article and pushed it for a week. And the first thing we had to decide since we, what our audiences were, we knew we wanted to talk to decision makers in the aerospace industry. So we had to determine where we want to send that success story out to. So we used, uh, we worked with a group called Related They're out of Toronto and they do they use artificial intelligence to determine the types of companies based on uh, various criteria that we set. And they were to showcase where these, uh, companies are that we wanted to communicate with. From here, we were able to determine uh, whether or not do we want the companies that were in the manufacturing arena, where we want stuff more in the support, we had chose manufacturing. We were able to narrow down the types of groups that seemed like a good fit, and then also narrow down the states that we wanted to market into. There isn't any real good reason to be spending money um, sending our success stories to states that don't have any aerospace professionals or businesses there. So we've kept it really targeted and focused. On the One East Kentucky page, we made some target industry pages for aerospace. And you can see that page here. There's an example of that. As you scroll down, there's an interactive map that shows the, uh, the proposed cluster and shows where all the, how Kentucky is in the center of a larger aerospace cluster where those companies are. And then when people came from the LinkedIn article back to the site, they'd see that there are quite a few uh, different aerospace related articles that were on the One East Kentucky site inside their news section. And these articles we posted um, throughout the month in support of the larger article. And here are the results. Um, we sent it out two different ways. There's the sponsored reach and there's the organic reach. The sponsored reach means we paid money to put this article onto the news wall of the specific people we were targeting. Uh, we were able to 
have 11,688 impressions, 133 clicks. We've got some social actions, which are sharing or uh, reposting or liking. Uh, there was 1.3% engagement. We had five new followers. It's an excellent uh, uh, campaign to do it. Even 1.3% is very good. On the organic reach, we were able to have 1,369 impressions. We've got 18 clicks, 23 actions, and almost a 3% engagement, which is outstanding. Now, organic reach means that um, the people that saw that article were already followers of either the One East Kentucky, Kentucky company page, or they were followers of Chuck, or they were followers of one of the other people that shared this article. So it got quite a bit of reach itself, and that was not sponsored and did not cost anything extra for, for them to get that kind of reach. Now you might be thinking, great, well, this is interesting. It's kind of like Google Analytics where you have a lot of data coming in, but how do you really know who saw what? And what's amazing about what LinkedIn's been able to put together is we have now have large data to be able to relate back to. We know that seven of those clicks were from Boeing or we know that five of them are from the United States Air Force. We know that 75 of the clicks were from aviation and aerospace and the 38 were from defense and space. So we know we were hitting the right people and that these clicks were coming from the very companies we were targeting. More so, we know the size of these companies. These aerospace companies uh, oftentimes had over 10,000 employees and 66 of the clicks came from those companies. And we also know where they're from. You know that some of them came from LA, some of them came from uh, greater Seattle area. Now we sent these, we targeted very specific states uh, once again. So we sent it out to Washington knowing that Chuck was gonna be in Washington the following week. So we made sure that all of the aerospace uh, decision makers there would see this on their LinkedIn wall. And just as important, we know what their role was. Well, we can tell if they were seniors, managers, owners, and see that four owners of aerospace companies clicked and read that article. Uh, we also can see um, if they were managers, presidents, uh, can get a sense of who the people are that actually made the clicks. Now, for one organization or one decision maker to see an article that gets them thinking about Eastern Kentucky, to give it some consideration and ultimately move a business there or expand an operation there makes this entire campaign uh, uh, incredibly successful. I just had a question come in. I'm gonna answer it quick. So it's what type of LinkedIn subscription do you need to get reporting that you talked about? And this reporting is included in the sponsoring of the story. So once we created the story, uh, you're paying to have it sponsored and then uh, it, they include as part of that uh, the ability to get all of this reporting. So uh, as far as I know, any level of a LinkedIn membership allows for that. Uh, LinkedIn was really impressed with our work and they recognized us in, in their October uh, newsletter uh, for the campaign that we ran on One East Kentucky. So we've been getting validation on our process and uh, why this is working. Now we had a chance to recreate it, and uh, this is uh, just as interesting and exciting. We they had another big success. Uh, Eastern Kentucky attract Enerblue, which was a battery making company, to the region. Uh, once again, we were able to make a nice announcement. Uh, we wrapped that up into a, a success story and posted on LinkedIn Pulse and got the word out to the targets, the same targets that we had got it up to before, uh, to to further nurture those. You can see there was, uh, uh, this was ran in the middle of December. There were still 15,000 impressions, social action, five social actions, 56 clicks. It was, the organic reach did pretty well. But what was really interesting was what happened on Facebook. Um, there was a video made just talking about how Interblue is coming to Eastern Kentucky. And this was posted on Facebook and it received 248,568 views, or uh, reached that many people, had 130,000 views, um, 2,248 shares. Uh, in my uh, 
professional career, I have never seen an economic development article go viral uh, quite like this, with an exception of some of the Amazon uh, or Amazon groups that have come. So when you take a look at this, uh, you'll wonder why is there so much traffic on this? And the traffic, most of the, the shares and most of the posts are actually people's names. What we found out is that the people of Eastern Kentucky were recommending these new jobs to their friends. And every time they add somebody's name to a as, a, as a post or as a comment, it would then post this entire video on that person's wall and it became viral. And so um, as a workforce attraction effort, and even as a awareness effort to make sure that Eastern Kentucky knew about this, uh, the, the people of Eastern Kentucky knew these jobs were coming into place, um, it was unprecedented response. They were uh, hugely successful with it. Which leads to the next area, which is the lead tracking and generation. Now, with lead tracking, like in the old days, and I'd say even today, we, always, we still have Google Analytics. And Google Analytics is great. It tells you a ton of information about your website. Uh, ultimately, all of the marketing is bringing people back to the website, uh, whether it's going to be the LinkedIn campaigns, uh, Facebook campaigns, workforce attraction, business attraction, it's all bringing people back to the site. And so keeping an eye on the site and having that be updated and current is critical. Now it's nice to be able to see where the traffic is and Google Analytics will tell you what pages people are going to, uh, where they're leaving, how much time they're spending, what the bounce rates are. This is all really good information, but never really answer the question of, are we getting the right people? Are these just random visits or is there actually a business behind it? And that is now being uncovered. And we work with a group called Lead Forensics. They're based out of uh, England and they have a large operation out of Atlanta. We've partnered with them to build an economic development related track lead tracking portal. And what you'll find in here is that now we can find a little more than just how many hits we had, we can see who those hits were from. And so in this example, this is the Golden Shovel site. You can see down on the second one down, it says International Economic Development Council. Uh, they uh, visited our site. Uh, they've been there. They looked at eight pages. They found us searching through Google. They spent 32 minutes on the site, which is great. So I can click on that. Now I can see uh, a little bit about their company, their address, the web web page I can go to, I can see that they actually visited eight different times. And that history is tracked down below. And so I can see what pages they went to, how much time they spent on each of the pages. So this is incredibly valuable because uh, on, a, on a handful of ways. One is it validates the work that we're doing. So if we send out a marketing campaign and we see that to attract aerospace people and we see that aerospace companies are coming to the website and looking at it and spending time on the aerospace pages, then it validates that the work we're doing is successful. Um, it's also a great way to see uh, what, what parts of the site are interesting to your audiences that, you're, that are coming to visit. So it's a little creepy in the sense that you don't want to necessarily just call up a company and say, I couldn't help but notice you were on our website. Because uh, until Amazon, I will say, <laughs> economic development is still pretty much a uh, confidential industry. Uh, people want to be anonymous. They don't want to necessarily promote that they're uh, looking for a place to move a headquarters or to move a, a business. And so um, that's not necessarily going to be the right approach. However, um, if you know that a company has been looking at your site or responded to your marketing, it doesn't hurt to set up a meeting with them at the next industry trade show that you might be visiting uh, to find opportunities to meet with that group or be at that the same place where their company is going to be. And uh, to know already that they know who you are and have seen your site gives you additional uh, support in, in nurturing those leads. And to go even further through, after the lead forensics, then you have groups like HubSpot, which are doing inbound marketing. And inbound marketing, uh, in a nutshell, 
is the marketing that starts after people have visited your website or social media tools. So if somebody is on your site and you're, this is great, I have a decision maker from Boeing who's been on our site looking at our aerospace page. Um, how, what do you do after that? How do you nurture that person to become a prospect and a lead uh, for a potential business move? And so HubSpot helps organize and track that type of information and make it so that uh, perhaps that same person that's interested in the article might be interested in a webinar that you're giving about the aerospace industry in the region. Or they might be interested in a white paper or an infographic that's been created to further support that. You already know they're interested in aerospace. You already know they're interested in your site. So there's what are the offerings you can have to keep your organization at top of mind awareness. So the next uh, topic I'd like to talk about, and this is something that's coming up, and it's not something that's immediately available now, but it's happening. So it is it is available now in some level. I'll just talk a little bit about it, but it's something that I believe, especially rural communities, are going to be able to take advantage of in a massive way and really level the playing field with um, some of the larger uh, metros. That's artificial intelligence. Now, when you first think of artificial intelligence, you might be thinking something like this. Uh, there's good reason for it. it. It's always been just a little bit scary. And it's kind of because we've got Putin out there saying that the leader in artificial intelligence is going to rule the world. You have Elon Musk out there saying that artificial intelligence is most likely going to cause World War III. Um, there's been a lot of uh, uh, a lot of fear out there about what actually might happen. Um, and But artificial intelligence is coming and it's gonna affect how we do business and it's greatly gonna affect how economic developers do business. And uh, just to touch a little bit, back in 1996 is when the computer first beat our best chess player that we have in the country. Um, when he, the, our chess player was beat, it's never been uh, passed since then. <laughs> Humans have not been able to beat the computer. A little longer later, we have Watson. Now, IBM's Watson plays Jeopardy, which has far fewer rules and much more uh, uh, knowledge-based uh, thoughts than, say, a game of chess. And uh, once our top Jeopardy players were beaten, we thought, well, okay, artificial intelligence is certainly getting better. But the one game that they're never going to beat us at is Go. Now, Go has more potential plays then there are atoms in the universe. That's the that's the, the calculation. And so it's a strategy game that's got so many variables and so many options. It uh, wasn't supposed to be beaten by AI for at least another decade, maybe longer it was predicted. Well, uh, 2016, two years ago, Google made a Go playing game called AlphaGo, and it beat our top human Go player he was out of China, and uh, um, we were very impressed that the AI was capable of doing that so quickly. To bring it to even another level, last year, um, Google made a, a second Go game called Alpha Zero. Now, Alpha Go, what they did is they put in all of the rules of Go, and they put in all of the games played by all of the experts into AlphaGo so that it could process and analyze it and make sense out of the Go game. And it had all of that data to use as its beginning as it learned how to play Go um, when it beat this guy. Now, AlphaZero didn't have any of the Go games put in it, just had the rules of Go, which are relatively simple. Now, when AlphaZero started playing, it was really, really bad. And over time, it got better and better, and it increased its strategies. And it got to a point where it was playing the same rules as humans and using a lot of the same strategies, which was amazing. But what was more amazing is it then scratched those strategies and went further along and started making up strategies that humans have never thought up. And uh, just last year, Alpha Zero beat Alpha Go 100 games to zero. So not only is uh, this technology increasing fast, but it's going to be increasing. Um, 
um, faster than we can even <laughs> handle. Which leads to questions like, who do you trust more to pick your stocks? Do you trust a person to pick them, or do you trust a computer to pick them? And of uh, uh, I saw a presentation at the International Economic Development Conference, and the presenter was talking about how he was presenting at a financial conference in Vegas, and he asked this question to all of these financial professionals, and almost all of them raised their hand that they'd rather have a computer pick a stock than a person, which is ironic since those are the people that would be picking the stocks. And so we're already using AI and going down this path. How does it affect our industry? Well, in some ways, and I mentioned like in the One East Kentucky campaign, we were able to use AI with the related group to find other types of companies to market to. Um, for an example, if the Brady Industries plant is a large aircraft aluminum plant that's going to be moving in eastern Kentucky but isn't there yet, we could use AI to find other types of plants that are similar in scope and scale. We can locate those plants around the country, and then we can look backwards to see what kind of support clusters appeared around those plants in the next 10 years after they were established in the region. We could then use that type of information to target our messaging to those types of support building, support companies in anticipation of that cluster growing around this plant. That's the type of intelligence that we now can create with a combination of uh, our knowledge of economic development and using AI. And there's groups like uh, FBI 365. Um, uh, this is from a research consultant international. They, this is more machine learning than, than artificial intelligence, but it's very similar. It's using lots of data to calculate the right leads for your business. All right, so the last uh, area I'm gonna talk about today is virtual reality. Uh, this is something I'm very passionate about, our company is thoroughly uh, involved with, and I believe is the future of economic development. Um, certainly economic development marketing. Now, what is virtual reality? So there's different types. Now, virtual reality itself is the idea that you can go into a virtual world and walk around it. Um, the virtual reality I'll be talking about today is called spherical video. So it's not something you necessarily walk around, but it's like standing in the middle of a sphere-shaped video. So you can look up down, left, right, and all around you, it gives you the quite intense feeling of actually being in a location. There's, um, you can navigate from a video to a video, uh, but that's the that's what the spherical video is. Um, it's shot using a camera that um, shoots in all different directions. In this case, the, this particular rig is shooting six different cameras in each different area, and then those six videos are stitched together into a sphere. Once we've got the, the videos put together and they you can execute them a handful of different ways. One thing is you can put a virtual reality video on your website. Uh, you can put, use them on a phone or a tablet. And it uses the gyro on the phone or tablet so you can move it around to, to actually look around the sphere. Uh, most effectively, it's used on headsets. And so in some cases, like in this picture, this lady could take her phone and put it inside a, a headset and look at it in a stereoscopic way. So no matter which way she looks, she's looking inside the spherical video. Uh, the best experiences are done by high-end versions. Uh, the one that we've used most often is the PlayStation VR system, just because of its portability. Um, these are the very first high-end VR headsets to hit the market. This all happened last year. Uh, we know of at least a dozen coming out this year. Um, some of them are already starting to, uh, the, but they're, they're getting smaller, they're getting more wireless, they're getting more portable, and uh, um, they're gonna be available uh, um, this year. And less expensive too, I should note. So how do we use them in economic development? Well, the thing about a VR tour on a headset is the when you look left and right and you're inside a video it tricks your brain into truly feeling like you're there um 
it's a, if you have never tried it and you have an opportunity to do, we set up demos at a lot of conferences around the country. If you get a chance to try one of ours, uh, there's uh, ones you can get and take a look at. Um, you can get some headsets on Amazon. If you want to get a headset to look at it through your phone, um, there's low as 20 bucks. Uh, absolutely cool. Um, there's different types of ways we use these tours. There's familiarization tours. Um, in the familiarization tour, we'll cover the types of businesses in the region. What is the workforce like? What is the um, quality of life like? What are the outdoor things to do? Uh, what, what kind of things do you have for entertainment? Uh, what is the healthcare like? What are the neighborhoods like where you can live? We're able to capture a full tour from a business perspective to get both a sense of if it's a good fit for your business and if it's a good fit for the people that'll be working uh, for your business. Um, site tours. And I'll give you an example of one today, um, is a little different flavor. Here we're focusing on a site that might be a good fit for a specific type of business. And uh, first we can highlight the site itself, but then you're going to be looking at uh, things that uh, are relevant to it, like some of the infrastructure. What about the clover leaf on the corner? What about the, um, the power grid and the transformers? And that's, that's all connected. What about the sewage? But then beyond that, you have things, the uh, glamour shots of the town that you're nearby and the schools that are nearby and the airports and what kind of places are neighboring uh, a potential business park. This is all stuff that's really relevant to a site tour. And it's the same type of stuff that a site selector would go on if you had a FAM tour. And we actually worked with um, some very site selection consultants to advise us on the what they want to see when they go on their tours, and we were able to apply that to the virtual reality tours that we've been creating. Workforce attraction is a great way to showcase to somebody and really allow someone to put themselves into that aspirational uh, story that you're trying to tell and uh, influence them to move to a region. So instead of just reading about somebody on the website, instead uh, you can have somebody saying, hey, look, here's my house, check it out. And you're looking around their yard and then suddenly they're in their work. They're like, this is where I work. This is my desk, here are my coworkers. You get a little flavor for that. And then big hair, I'm done with work. It's five minutes later and I'm fishing in this stream just 10 minutes from my house. You know, this is what I do for fun. Um, and really truly give the a full passionate experience of why somebody loves living in a region and do it in a way where it, leaves the people um, moved and inspired. Now we see these used in a variety of different ways. Uh, the first thought is industry shows. Um, if you're over in Hanover, Mass, Germany, and there's a guy from Taiwan who's in, and you're trying to con explain to them what it's like in Duluth, Minnesota, um, they're not necessarily gonna know. Their first question might be, where is Duluth? And you say, oh, it's in northern Minnesota. They might say, where's Minnesota? It's like, oh, um, it's, uh, they might say, how far is it from Chicago? Oh, yeah, six hours from Chicago. Uh, they don't necessarily know the lay of the land. And unless you're a very top tier city, they're not likely to um, be able to gain a lot about what makes one, one town better or worse than another town. Now, to date, People have been able to give printed flyers. You can have a maybe a video playing on behind you. You might have a nice banner and a booth. You might be able to set up a meeting with these guys. But now, instead of just doing that, since there's a hundred of these all in a row, why not take them out of the trade show, have them put on a headset, and spend five to eight minutes in your community, actually experiencing um, the highlights of exactly what you want to share. Uh, this will give them a feeling of actually being there. It's the absolute best way to transport someone to your community without putting them on a plane and flying them. Um, site selection, this is a great opportunity for site selection. You can um, bring your actual site with you to uh, meet with site selectors, uh, be able to share with them. Um, the highlights of your particular site. Um, oftentimes site selection groups cannot send all their people, so they can only send some of them. And so the people that can't make it can still experience the site themselves uh, through that. Career fairs, what better way to showcase what it's like to work at your business 
than to actually give somebody a feeling of standing there in the business. And these tools also can, of course, be shared through the website and through apps on your phone. And so I'm gonna give you just a little example. I'm gonna pull up what a spherical video looks like. Now this is a specific site that we uh, created for Great River Energy. It's a primary data center site. It's located in St. Cloud, Minnesota. And the first thing I wanted to show you is as I scroll around, how you can see the entire site as if you were standing there. Now there's graphics on it. We're able to put graphics. Um, and those can fade in and out just like actual video. You can see it can cut from one video to another. And the first few shots are really focused on the site itself. But then it can show the utilities and the power infrastructure. It can show the connecting roads. Here's, this is uh, highlighting the fiber optic infrastructure goes over into the schools in the region so people can get a sense of where the workforce might come from it also touches on the neighborhoods and then ends up with some contact information of who to, to contact about the property now they use this tour uh, both as um, once again to be able to use at booths and shows but they're particularly looking to attract data centers and so all of this video is made to, to speak to those groups. So if you go to placevr.net, you can see examples of uh, different types of tours that we've been able to build. And here is a Greg Wassman's door. He's from Newmark Knight Frank. We unveiled this, the first VR technology in Toronto in 2017. It was the mid-September. And uh, he is taking a look. He's actually watching the Apex region VR video here at our booth. Um, it was very, very exciting. He, he saw the whole video and he took off the headset and the first thing he said was, I feel like I've been there. It really leaves the question of what the future site visit is going to look like. Um, at that same conference at IEDC, we went to a uh, kind of an entertainment district and we found this giant VR Ghostbuster game that was playing. And Here's uh, uh, myself and a couple site selectors. We put all of our goggles on and actually had mobile packs where you could walk. You'd end up walking through rooms, and we were able to go and fight the state state puff marshmallow guy. And uh, when you looked at each other, you all looked like uh, characters from Ghostbusters with the Ghostbuster outfits on. And it was completely engaging. It completely fools your brain that you're that this is real, and it just uh, we're going to see uh, developments in this technology dramatically over the next couple of years. And I believe the, all economic development groups are going to use this technology. A great thing for rural groups to take advantage of, especially when they have the, the toughest time differentiating themselves. So thank you very, very much, everybody, for attending and, and listening to this presentation. Um, I'll just open it up and see if there's any questions that might have come in. and. Uh, Okay, here's a good question. Uh, many rural communities have no or limited resources, especially with web expertise. How can they leverage the techniques you are showing? Um, what's interesting about these new technologies is they allow you to get a lot more bang for your buck. Um, I guess that's kind of cliche, but it's true in this case. Um, take example, advanced marketing with LinkedIn. You can spend a dollar in the past to put, get a magazine ad, knowing that your ad will be in a magazine, but you don't know necessarily how many people are going to look at it. Um, of that entire magazine's audience, you don't know exactly how many of those people are actual decision makers or people that are going to be interested in your ad. Um, that was expensive without really knowing if you're getting any results. Now we can use those same dollars and make sure that the success story that you're writing gets directly in front of this specific person that you're trying to hit. You're only paying to get that 
story in front of that person. You're not paying to just throw it out there to a bunch of uh, uh, unknown uh, people. So there's just a lot of opportunity. And, and it's the same thing with the VR. The VR isn't that incredibly expensive to develop. It's just brand new technology. And certainly for the first few years, there's going to be a competitive edge for the groups that develop them. Uh, one of the questions came in about what, what are the average costs for a high quality VR video? And um, the costs can uh, differ and vary, uh, certainly depending on the number of, uh, number of days, uh, production shoots, uh, how many videos uh, that are possible to create at the same time. Like sometimes it really makes sense to do a, at the same time as doing a familiarization tour, also making a site tour video or also doing a tourism related video. Uh, so those, uh, uh, those all play into it. But um, on average, the average VR video starts at around $20,000. Uh, there was a question about if we could share slides. Absolutely, we'll share these slides. And uh, also, um, we'll have this uh, entire presentation recorded. So people can certainly uh, watch it again if they'd like and share it. Um, another question that came in, it says, as you mentioned, technology can level the playing field. As it becomes more readily available and affordable, how will communities differentiate themselves and create a unique message amongst all the white noise? <laughs> That's a, that is a fantastic question. Um, what's important, in the, I mean, as far as standing out and having the unique message, that's where these stories come into play because the stories of your community are the unique messaging. It's what's unique about each community. Um, the more powerful that story is, the better the story is, and we've talked about what makes a good story, the more it's gonna stick in people's mind. And that's at the beginning of us. If you don't have a great story to, to differentiate yourself, um, then it's gonna be a, difficult to get through the noise because those are the things that are gonna be louder and are gonna stand out. Um, but the other part of this is this technology isn't going to stop. And what I'm proposing, and the reason I started with the two slides about how fast this technology is changing, is as an industry, we need to change our mindset that we're going to continue adopting the new technologies as they come. Um, it, any of the things that I showed you today, even the VR videos, you can make one today, but the technology is going to keep changing. It's going to be different in a year. It's going to be different in two years. You're going to make a decision. You know, on one hand, you could say, well, if it's going to change, why buy it now? I'm going to wait till it becomes better. But my point is it's going to be coming better faster and faster and faster. And if you wait for one year, you're going to be one year behind all of the groups. And in 10 years, you'll be a thousand times behind. <laughs> that was the point of the how quickly things are changing. So there is gonna be a lot of white noise. There's gonna be all sorts of early adopters and late adopters. Um, and by the time the late adopters are catching on, the early adopters are gonna be on to the next thing. And that's where the most progressive economic developers should be. Uh, one of the questions came in, should we have a separate LinkedIn account for the organization and for the director? And I said, Absolutely. Um, we're, we're partnered with LinkedIn and we've been working closely with the LinkedIn team about our strategies and, and how to make them more successful. And it was direct uh, feedback and recommendations from them that you start your articles on your company page. Um, now, right now, because of the nature of LinkedIn and because it's been focused on individual professionals for quite a while, most people have more followers on their uh, individual personal pages than they do on their company pages. Uh, so it, it takes a concerted effort to build a following behind a company page. But the truth is that it's stronger that way because then you can post an article off your company page and then multiple people that are within that company can then share it, comment on it, and spread it still to their networks. And so that way you're building up the company page along with the individual director pages. All right, are there, um, that is the 
poll of questions so far. Is there any other uh, questions out there that anybody might have? Feel free to type them in. There, uh, Aaron, I just want to uh, be respectful of people's times. I see people are, uh, have reserved an hour and, and we'll see people starting to log off here. But I just want to remind everybody, all the slides and the recorded webinar will be available and sent out. And we invite you to check out our website. And if you have more questions, certainly contact us. We'd love to talk to you a little bit more in depthly about uh, things that you'd like to solve and, and issues that you're trying to resolve in your community. So again, thank you. Uh, I really think it was a, a very valuable web, uh, webinar. And I hope that uh, we'll have some more of these in the future with you. Thank you so much. Appreciate everybody attending and have a wonderful afternoon. We'll see you at the next webinar.